Let's begin. Uh, first and foremost, with the matters of national security, the governor of Brunei said Professor Babangana Zulum has raised the alarm over renewed attacks by suspected Boko Haram terrorists on farmers in communities within the state. Governor Zulum, in a condolence visit to five communities in Jere and Mafa local government areas, where eight farmers and scavengers were brutally murdered, alleged sabotage of efforts to restore security to the troubled state before the murder of eight scavengers and farmers on Thursday in Shuari, Kalari, Tamsu, Ngamdua, and Baram, Karamawa, and Muna communities. There are being similar attacks on farmers in Burundi communities in recent weeks. Take a listen to Governor Zulum. I cannot say we have started with anything the insurgents, but within the last few years, we have seen some pockets of attacks and this will not be allowed to continue like this uh, i think we have some group of people that are trying to sabotage the efforts of the federal government uh, that want to create artificial insecurity and therefore we must rise up to our responsibility and attack the issues squarely just yesterday, some people were killed. Uh, people cannot have access to their agricultural lands easily. We had access in 2020, 2021, 2022. I see no reason why we can't have access now. But I have seen the army personnel. We shall have a meeting. We shall ensure establishment of a strong mechanism. Well, a top military source within the army confirmed to China's television that a murder of about 16 farmers in Molai and Kayamala communities was because they went 11 kilometers away from the stipulated areas here marked for farming activities which they have been warned against. <sighs> Palatinobu government came into force on the 29th of May. Since then, they inherited little loads of problems including security um financial problems unity issues of unity or how to unite this nation several other issues are there that are threatening the existence of our nation but then how does the tinubu administration that a few days ago announced a shake-up within the military hierarchy and leadership how can they face up to some of these challenges and tonight we'll be getting insight into uh into all of these issues and from two experts one is a researcher a scholar and a field consultant on security matters and the other was a field general who retired from the army i'm being joined tonight by general anthony uh Atolagbe, who is a former uh, field commander of the Joint Task Force of the Nigerian Military and also a former commander of Operation Safe Haven. He's also been involved in commanding troops with ECOMOG and all what have you. He's uh, joined us from Obajana virtually in Kogisa. Thank you so much, General, for joining us tonight. Um, you see what is happening, the statement made by uh, Governor Zulum and you, you wonder what exactly is going on. One, well, we think that we've, um, we're seeing some kind of respite in some of the attacks. Of, but he has warned that there seems to be a resurgence in the issue of country insurgency in that part of the country. Give us an understanding of what could have gone wrong. Uh, good evening, uh, listeners. Um, it is actually true that... Uh, the insurgents have been degraded. And what happens in that uh, situation is that they begin to disintegrate. They get disorganized. Their activities are disrupted. And in so doing, they break into splinters so that uh, it becomes an issue of survival. They start making efforts to see that they don't go down alone. They also exploit the idea that perhaps uh, if they 
are running out of money, or maybe food, they start looking for other means of surviving. And uh, these are the kind of situation that enhances these sort of activities from the insurgents. Uh, usually, when operations are conducted in this manner, uh, we, first of all, we, uh, we, we, we go through some stages of the operation in which the operation is shaped. Okay, we deter, we also seize, and then uh, we dominate the area. From domination, you go to stabilization. And then from stabilization, you hand over to civil power. So uh, you now find out that in the process, there could be some gaps. Gaps in the sense that uh, when the troops move forward from maybe captured locations and try to exploit further, there might be room where perhaps the review of the concept does not cover some areas. And then these insurgents, they exploit those kind of situations. Uh, not only that, uh, they want to take revenge. Maybe it's the, they want to they feel that, oh, it's, it's these people from this community might have been the one that reported them and the rest of it. So those are the kind of uh, circumstances that uh, bring this kind of uh, situation into the theater. Uh, but there are also, when this kind of thing happens, commanders on the ground know what to do. And it's, uh, it's quite interesting to find that the governor is right in front of this, uh, this operation and is making a lot of efforts with the support of the military, telling us that is going to consult with them, and then they will take appropriate action. So, General, if I may jump in quickly. So, it then means that, what it means is that our troops need to be permanently be on the ground uh, uh, to be able to curtail or stop attacks. What about the issue of retrieval of the military and align the civil uh, policing in that area to be able to, to maintain uh, civil engagement uh, within that area? Because one would think that, uh, from what we understand, that there are a lot of the military activities will have now since they say they have decimated these terrorists. Okay, thank you for that question. And uh, I was just gradually uh, moving into that particular aspect. What happens is that the situation within the battle space or spread across the battle space is not always the same. So it's like you are advancing through uh, a particular location and then you move from that location after capturing to another location. Now, what, they, what we do is we begin to graduate the locations according to the threats that are available there. Where the insurgents are actually occupying, we graduate them from five to one. So at five is intense threat, okay? And then at four is the relative threat. At three is perhaps containable threat. So you keep going down until you go to one. And isn't there, sorry, that, apologies, General. Isn't there a digital way to manage this threat? Uh, haven't we graduated to the point that we can remotely monitor the activities based on the encroachment on the borders or this guerrilla warfare is so uh, planted in our society and the communities there that is so difficult to manage digitally or remotely? Well, this, this aspect of the question now is uh, looking at how to profile solution to the issues on the field. And um, now we are just trying to discuss aspects that has to do with what might have been responsible, okay? And then is, are there, are there uh, various elements that are supposed to be on the ground? If you say there is intense threat, it should be purely military. And then where there is a lower threat, beyond the below intense threat, you are talking about military and maybe counter police men. Okay, and then coming down, you now start, to, start talking about 
some elements of the military at maybe level three, and then start talking about some elements of the military and mobile police, and maybe counter a few counter-terror police. And then when you go to one, they're talking about just the regular policemen. So, but at no time should the space be open for people to uh, just freely walk in. There are other things that can be done to also ward off these people. And uh, perhaps when we come to profiling solutions, then right. we'll be discussing those areas. Okay. Just a moment, General. Let me let me bring in uh, Mr. Kabiru Adam, who is executive director of uh, Bacon Consulting, a security uh, setup uh, that's come up with a report on the state of security in the land. Uh, Mr. Adam, if you, if you look at what is going on and the statement of the governor of Borneo State about the resurgence uh, in this issue, and he has raised a question on counter uh, insurgency operations around that region. What in your mind could have been responsible? Um, thank you, uh, Sheung. Um, in simple terms, it's the inability of the Nigerian state, especially the security forces, to win the hearts and minds of the people. Um, terrorism, in simple terms, is a battle of hearts and minds. The enemy takes advantage of vulnerabilities, sometimes using socioeconomic issues, sometimes ideological, sometimes political, and then attempts to either recruit or sometimes force the people to participate in its activities. Now, over time, the last 11, 12 years, we've not done very well in our ability to change this narrative and get the people to support us. Um, it's essentially an asymmetric warfare where the enemy is embedded inside the communi communities. Um, just last week, or, or thereabout, the new speaker of the Borno State Assembly um, went on air to the hearing of the whole world and said his local government, which is Guzamala, is still in the hands of um, the, you know, the, the bad guys, as, as it were. Uh, so clearly, that ability to win the hearts and minds of the people, and by doing that, um, suffocate this, the, this enemy, we've not been able to do that. And the simple reason for that is we've concentrated too much on kinetic warfare. Uh, the last time I was told, and General can confirm this, we use about 80% of kinetic warfare and then 20% of the non-kinetic component. I, I must commend the Borno State Government for coming up with several components of this non-kinetic um, approach. And you remember that recently, starting from about two years ago, several of these insurgents were you know, submitting themselves and surrendering. A significant part of that is because of this non-kinetic um, component. So now, what can we do? And I asked the general a question, and it took us to the field, trying to give us a picture and a graphic uh, 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 portrayal of what uh, could have gone wrong and what we need to start thinking about. But from research that I've come up, is there any kind of gap that we have seen so far in the confidence building mechanism or the, the kind of communication that the military and the government has given the people of Nigeria as to the progress of the fight against insurgency? Has there been any kind of gap? Uh, has there been any kind of relapse so far? Um, yeah, uh, we have uh, a coordinator of counterterrorism, and frankly, I, I can't remember when last I had any statement from that that, that office. And um, specifically, it's possible that the office is working on on the ground. It's possible that it's doing a lot, but the level of engagement with Nigerians, particularly with the residents of the affected location, the three states of Borno, Yobe, and Adamawa, um, I think there is room for improvement there. Uh, also, very interestingly, we have the countering violent extremism component of our counterterrorism strategy. The level of implementation of that um, um, component is not very transparent. Um, I can't recall any time in the recent uh, past where there has been any attempt by any of the implementers of that approach to give us a sense of where we are. I, I just gave you a, um, an indication that we're probably doing 80% kinetic and 20% um, non-kinetic. So in, to that extent, I think there is a huge gap. The third point for a, a simple counter-terrorism approach would be three to achieve three things. Um, deny them the ability to recruit new members, 
deny them the ability to generate funding and then deny them their, 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 their ability to um, obtain e equipment. Now, um, thirdly, uh, I think there are, there's room for improvement in these three areas that I've mentioned. Let me take you through the report, the security report that Beacon Consulting, your company, released. Uh, you've been consistent in releasing reports on security situation in the country, at least in the last uh, several months. And the one that you released in the month of May, let me take Nigeria through what um, that report represents. And I'm worried now with uh, the cases in Plateau State, uh, I mean, thank God we have uh, General Adelagbe with us on the program. We had served in uh, Joss before in Plateau State, where we're seeing uh, fatalities as much as 126 in the month of May alone. Um, so it's, this is uh, worrying. But let me take you through, everyone, what this may, uh, all of these issues are. There are events, abductions, you can see the figures and how they have gone. There seems to be a low in some areas in abduction, in fatality, you will see how things have gone. Um, abductions and fatalities uh, in raid, ambush, combat, crossfire. You can see crossfire, ambush, there are rising uh, issues in fatalities and there are rising a number of uh, uh, in uh, um, raid in some parts of uh, the month. But Take a look at abduction and fatalities uh, uh, in the north central by region. You will see how things have gone. Southwest, south, south, uh, southeast, northwest, as uh, perhaps the second highest. The north central has the highest with 261 fatalities, abduction 66. And we've seen uh, northwest with more abductions, uh, which is 69. You look at events of abductions uh, in the month of May. The weeks and how things have gone, you can see the projection. But where, again, I have an, uh, uh, some kind of worry is the state-by-state state, uh, report of fatalities. Ratu has the highest, 126, followed by Bruno, 123, and Benue, 51. Give us a summary of what these reports represent, Mr. Adam. Um, in simple terms, it is the use of data. Um, modern um, inter intelligence, as it were, is really all about data. And we realized that there was a huge gap uh, in your program. I've uh, previously uh, used the term that it, it appears our security you know, departments uh, uh, have this morbid, morbid fear for data. And so we saw that gap. And then we, you know, we, we attempted to close that gap um, within two minutes. You can have a visualization that would give you the 774 local local governments of Nigeria, and from that visualization, you would know which local government in within a period had more uh, of a particular security incident. You, we, using abduction as an example, you'll be able to see from that clearly which local government was affected by abduction, which one was abducted by the several other violent um, crimes that were, were, were monitoring. And if I was the commander, as an example, the National Security Advisor or the Chief of Defense Staff or the, Pol the Inspector General of Police, I would know which resources to deploy on the basis of this visualization that I've been able to, to gather. So that's, in summary, what, we, what we've attempted to do for the past 24 months. We've been publishing this um, you know, report, sharing it with the security agencies, uh, trying to get them to understand the relevance of the coll collection, um, collation, analysis, and the dissemination of um, you know, reports using data. Um, and then more importantly, the, to allow this as a decision-making tool for you know, man managers at, 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 that, at that level. Um, we, ha we are short of resources. Uh, I think nobody is in doubt about that. And where you are able to deploy these resources in a judicious manner using that, this type of um, trend analysis, then I think you, the value for money for Nigerians. And what is that value for money? Reducing the threat um, vulnerabilities of the average Nigerian in my village, in your village, and you know, every other Nigerian across the 774 local governments. Before I bring back uh, General Atalagbe, quickly, the shakeup that we've seen in the top hierarchy of the Nigerian military and in the leadership from President Tunubu, after his third week with the big stick, got a new team to work with him on issue of security. Give us your view. 
on the kind of people that has been that has been appointed and the kind of job that is done in this appointment will it help what are the issues that you have quickly sir okay uh, on a general note i think it's it's the first step um these individuals will be implementing the national security strategy and then the several other policies that we have in place and there are challenges within the structure and the institutions that they are going to inherit so they would need the support of um the government the support especially the executive and legislative arm and every nigerian in terms of them as individuals as persons i have no doubt um in their capacity uh i also think the president has made a very bold statement by deviating from the, what we've seen in the last, uh, you know, uh, since 1999, when military generals were appointed as the national security advisor. So he's made a bold statement to say that I would want a civilian, and I, I strongly agree with him. I think it's time that we give, we give a non-military person that, that, that opportunity. We've tried the military, uh, and we've seen what they've been able to do. So let someone who is non-military now give it a try. Um, in doing that, I'm hoping that the occupant of that office now would have a global look at the security um, structure that we have in Nigeria. The other time I was in your program, we show, you showed the 29 ministries, departments, and agencies. I would expect the, that individual to see how each and every component of that 29 can contribute to national security, and then how all the elements of our national power, including our diplomacy, can contribute to the achievement of our revised national strategy 2019. Now, for the service chiefs, especially the chief of defense staff, his role is to coordinate the other arms and provide that military apparatus, that structure that every Nigerian is, it will be proud of. Of course, the Inspector General of Police at the lead um, agency in internal security uh, um, units, I would strongly urge him to look closely at the area of intelligence. And by intelligence, I mean modern intelligence. I just spoke about data. Um, he, with all the police commands that he has spread across the 36 states and then the other divisions that, that he has, will be in a good position um, cooperating and collaborating with the civil defense, with the immigration, with customs and the several others to have adequate intelligence that would be able to tell him indicators of national security events even before they happen and then he addresses them. Because his role really is preventative and not necessarily reactive. Right. Um, it's usually when he feels that the military will come in. So I'm, I'm quite confident with the team that has been gathered. If we give them the right atmosphere and the right support, mm. I, I'll be um, quite um, delighted with what they'll be able to do. Let's anchor on this issue of security with General Atalagbe, and I'd like him to weigh in on some of the issues that you, uh, you have raised. General, give us an understanding of the way forward, the solution, uh, a new president, there are new... Uh, um, uh, top brass, I mean, the new leadership in the military. Some of these people are your junior in the military, and the way to go under a new president. And uh, the for, I mean, one of the few times that we have a president without a military background. What do you hope that will be done to ensure Nigeria is more secured? Thank you very much. Um, let me start from the top. Um, we all we agree with me that uh, there is a general discourse that the current uh, president uh, is is well grounded <clears throat> in uh, in uh, in leadership and uh, in governance, drawing from the fact that uh, he is coming from so many areas, not just the military. So uh, if we look at that aspect, we see uh, a situation where somebody is actually uh, prepared or has all what it takes to hold the reins you know, of, uh, of leadership. Now, uh, coming to these officers that have been appointed, uh, my I think it's just time that uh, we are gradually having the right set of people in, uh, in leadership, in the sense that these are officers that uh, we taught in uh, staff college on uh, the aspect of uh, maneuvering approach to warfare. 
And uh, that project happened to be a TS under me when I was chief instructor. So I know uh, these guys very well, and I know their capabilities, their uh, intelligent set of people. And I also know that with the experiences they have had on the field, it also adds to their competencies because they have been there and they will be able to tell exactly how it was and how, in fact, they can even project and advise those that are on the field that, look, that location, if you go there, you need to consult with the leadership of the village and then they will give you the necessary uh, human, uh, humans, that is uh, human intelligence that you require or the necessary support that you require to make sure that you succeed in that area. These are the kind of advantages that these uh, appointments will offer. I also wish that they also have some uh, international experiences also because most of their jobs are not yeah. confined to internal operations. They are, we, we adopt troops outside the country. We give support to other countries yeah. in West Africa and uh, in other parts of the world. So, I mean, I, I, I'm confident that uh, these guys uh, are the right choices that right. they will deliver. General Atalagbe, a former uh, commander of Operation Safe Haven and uh, com a former com field commander of the JTF and commander of the SCF and commander of the UNAMI. Thank you so much, General, for your time, as well as Dr. Kabiru Adamu, uh, the executive director of Bacon Consulting, a security consultant. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for your time tonight. Thank you for having us.